So let's bring it back into the conference. We just had just a wonderful keynote address and fireside chat with Director Ionku from the PTO. A uh, great morning session. And now this afternoon, we're turning to the IP and antitrust part of our conference. And I just couldn't be more thrilled to introduce my good friend and the Dean of Scalia Law School, Henry Butler. His formal title, of course, is the Allison and Dorothy Rouse Dean and George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law. I don't usually use that when I talk to him, but you know, it is his formal <laughs> title. I also just want to give, I don't want to take too much of the panel's time, but um, as some of you may have seen the announcement that we have a new Dean coming in, Dean Ken Randall, who we're just very excited about uh, Ken coming in. And he's going to do a fantastic job for us, but really um, just he will be able to build on the amazing platform that Henry has built just in many things, organizing Scalia, doing a lot of stuff with the space. They made our space in the law school building so much better than it had been before. Just amazing fundraising. Um, just, you know, we can't thank Henry enough. And so with that now, I wanna turn it over to Henry to run the panel. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for that in introduction. And uh, yes, I'm counting the days down. Uh, November 30th is my last day as uh, Dean and I'll be back running our Law and Economics Center um, and it's, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be moderating this panel on the intersection of uh, IP and, and antitrust and, uh, uh, globally as well as uh, nationally. Uh, we're going to kick off with one of our great alums, uh, Maureen Olhausen, uh, former uh, acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission and a practicing attorney with Baker and Botts. Maureen, it's all yours. Well, th thanks, Henry. I'm delighted to be here, uh, and also with uh, so many old old friends uh, on on this issue. Um, so I'm going to do a little, I think, kind of uh, setting the table for so some of the, the discussion that we're that we're going to have. Uh, you know, talking about uh, intellectual property and antitrust law uh, and the intersection of the two, sometimes comfortably and sometimes not so comfortably. Um, so I have slides, uh, and I don't know if folks can see. The slides, there we go. Excellent. So IP meets antitrust around the globe because the important thing to keep in mind is that what we do here in the US has ramifications. Other countries look to our positions uh, and also look to see where they can push, right? Where they can kind of impinge a little bit more probably on some uh, very valuable IP rights under the antitrust banner if they can find uh, similar things uh, happening in, in the US. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, yes, so I'll touch just briefly on these topics, how important innovation is to the economy, how, you know, the debates that have been happening, this has been a really a time of ferment here. Uh, and then that, as I said, that sometimes comfortable and sometimes uncomfortable intersection between IP and antitrust law. Um, some of the FTC and DOJ initiatives talk about comfortable and uncomfortable. Uh, there's been some <laughs> consistency and some conflict there. And then I'll touch briefly on some recent blockbuster cases, which I imagine others might touch on as well. So if we go to the next slide, you can see how important innovation is to the US economy. These aren't just esoteric, you know, wonky discussions, these have real world ramifications because IP, intellectual property innovation is so important to the US economy. You can see since the 1940s, how much of that you know, growth has been attributed to that, how much it is of the US GDP. So these, this, these are not um, sort of side debates. These are really, really, really key for US competitiveness and for economy overall. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, so there, there is this change, there's been this debate going on <clears throat> on whether the patent laws have uh, granted too much protection. Um, has it, have they stifled competition? Is there bargaining in the shadow of, you know, uh, the, the IP laws just too, too onerous? So that I think you know, we had lots of things about patent trolls and patent assertion entities and, you know, injunctions and all, all that kind of stuff that is, generated really a lot of um, debate here. Um, so if we go to the next slide, there's this question of the intersection of, of patents and, and antitrust law. Um, and so when you have 
a case law, patents really mentioned, not just case law mentioned in the constitution that gives an entity um, the ability to exclude everyone, right? If they have the IP right, they can, that's the core thing of an IP right is to say, I get to determine how to use it. I get to determine whether I share it with anyone and, and under what terms. So in some cases that, not in every case, but that can give a monopoly position. Then you have antitrust law, which is often characterized maybe very broadly as being against monopolies, right? So how, how do these two work together? And it really comes at the idea that IP law creates the right incentives to innovate, to invest in R&D and to innovate. And then through that innovation, that's where we see new forms of dynamic competition take place. So if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the real flashpoints here has been in our very complex economy, it's not just that someone makes a product and manufactures it themselves and it has a single patent on it. Um, I mean, you might see that in the pharma space, but in our tech, very he tech heavy space, what you see is that um, hundreds of patents are necessary to you know, today's complex products and not everyone who's the inventor or the, um, the researcher wants to be the one who makes the product. And there's lots of benefits to having standards that set the, um, that, that harmonize all of this, where you have the, the patents brought together into a certain standard, there's a promise, they will be licensed on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms to licensees who can then go manufacture the products. Uh, and so a lot of the um, tension in antitrust law has really revolved around these fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory promises uh, that the IP holders make to the standard setting organization, because the standard setting organization then picks the technology, right? That uh, is the one that is uh, necessary to meet the standard. It's called the standard essential patent. Um, and so it gives you know, market power to the entity who has the, um, has that technology. Sometimes they have market power already, if that's the only way to solve it, uh, to, to, to meet that um, technological need. But this is really where the, the, the rubber has met the road in antitrust. So we go to the next, uh, the next slide. Um, so the US antitrust agencies have long acknowledged that a, uh, a package or blanket licensing um, can raise antitrust concerns, but don't always, right? So it really depends on, you know, what the agreements are. Are you sort of fencing other people out of the market? Or are there other ways to solve this? Or are you, is it essentially the same as merging to, you know, have a, you know, a, a, a market position? Um, so I'm just seeing some of the basic issues here. If we go to the next slide, um, there have been a lot of FTC and DOJ initiatives in the IP licensing space, kind of going back to the 70s, where there was a lot of restrictions on the ability to use your IP and to license. And then I think as more economic um, analysis has happened and greater research, we've kind of moved away from that. So if you look at the 2017 FTC and DOJ joint update, because they have uh, guidelines on the licensing of intellectual property, it continues to say that there should be strong IP rights in the US that IP rights grant enforceable rights that have social value and that there's generally no liability for an IP holder to say, I'm not going to license my technology to you. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, so this <laughs> uh, agreement in January of 2017 um, reflects some agreement on broader principles, but there's been a lot of dispute and debate between the FTC and the DOJ um, on what is the right approach. Uh, there were some IP um, statements, antitrust and IP statements made during the previous administration that the current department of, uh, previous administration antitrust division that the current department has not agreed with. And they have withdrawn um, from some of those previous uh, or withdrawn some of those previous statements and guidance. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is really based on DOJ's what they call the new Madison approach. This is Macon Del Rahim, the head of the antitrust division, articulated this. 
And he basically said, so I talked about the standard setting organization. So when you have the standard and you agree to the standard, right, there, there can be conduct on both sides of the table that can create problems. And in the previous administration, they looked at this really from the viewpoint of the implementers who were saying, we've invested in creating this product and now the IP holder is not gonna license to us on terms that we think are fair and reasonable and non-discriminatory. And we've invested this money and they're, hold, they're holding us up, right? And so a lot of the Obama approach, Obama administration approaches were from that lens. So in the current administration, they kind of looked at it from the other side of the table and said, is this really happening? Is this idea that implementers are like, you know, not being able to, um, you know, negotiate fairly because there's just too much patent holdup. And what about holdout? What about the idea that the implementers are tell, telling the IP holders, we're not gonna pay you, right? So, so that if they look at it more from, uh, I think, both sides of the table. Um, and so this is the thing that the say that standard setting organizations should protect more against holdout to ensure maximum incentives to innovate because otherwise who wants to get, put their IP in the standard if they can't get the returns from it. Um, the way they can do this, IP holders can do this is through getting an injunction, uh, which the previous administration greatly disfavored. Um, and according to the new Madison approach, uh, an unconditional refusal to license a valid patent should be per se legal. Now, as I mentioned, there's the FTC and the DOJ, and the FTC agrees with some of this, but not all of this. And uh, so there's been some interesting fallout from that. So if we go to the next slide, um, these things have been widely discussed in different hearings and, and, and things like that. And kind of going to the next slide, we'll just talk about DOJ advocacy in the courts on this. So interestingly, the Department of Justice, as I said, is, has tried to express its new viewpoints and kind of undo some previous positions taken, uh, positions taken by the previous administration. And then they've done this through a, a number of different vehicles, a joint amicus brief with the USPTO. If we go to the next slide, um, they've given business review letters on some of these topics. Um, and then uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, okay, well, uh, and then the one after that. Okay, so, so there has been like kind of this movement on the policy, the, the procedural, the guidelines, the business review kind of front, uh, but the FTC has proceeded with a case called um, FTC versus Qualcomm. It was brought just a couple days before the end of the uh, Obama administration, right, right before the inauguration of President Trump, where they're charging Qualcomm with monopolizing uh, semiconductor device um, technology with the idea that um, the promises that Qualcomm had made to the standard setting organization uh, were not being you know, upheld and that this was an antitrust violation and that um, there was a problem there. Now, I dissented on that case. I objected to it. I didn't think there was a strong enough argument. I thought it, it, it failed um, as a legal and um, evidentiary matter. Uh, but anyway, the case went forward. It was litigated. Um, if we go to the next case, uh, I'm sorry, the next thing. So the US Department of Justice uh, intervene, well, it starts weighing in on this case, which is very unusual for it to start weighing in on a, the, its sister agency's antitrust cases. Um, the lower court, Judge Koh, uh, upholds the FTC's um, position in a very, very sweeping dissent. I'm sorry, a sweeping um, uh, decision. It has and it has global impact. It's glo you know wants things to be relicensed, uh, renegotiated globally. So it's very very sweeping uh, decision. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, so of course this gets appealed. Um, and actually, if we go back one, oh, let's see. Yeah, the Qualcomm. All right, we'll we'll stick there. So so anyway, so this. Okay, so if we go down to the next one, I. The one with the globe, right? I talked about 
right? This has a big impact. Then we go to the next slide. Um, so this gets appealed to the Ninth Circuit. And uh, the DOJ, so the FTC is appealing, um, so Qualcomm's appealing it. Um, and uh, the DOJ weighs in to say the FTC's decision is wrong. And it gets actually part of the oral argument time. So uh, fast forward to recently and the Ninth Circuit um, overturns the, the, the district court and finds that the FTC's uh, theory is not um, persuasive. And they say, um, you know, that it's hyper competitive behavior, not any competitive behavior. So, uh, and then the FTC now um, files an appeal, I'm sorry, files a request for a rehearing en banc of this. So you know we'll see we'll see that was just recently done we'll see what happens there. So if we go to the next um, slide, there are also some other you know recent blockbuster cases. Um, I won't I won't dive into them now for for um, time reasons, but you can see that there has been a little more of a trend away from this idea that IP holders are very constrained by antitrust that they can't get injunctions that they you know, they have to license really, you know, all comers at all, all times to, I think in the courts, as this has worked its way through the courts, there's been this movement away from those, um, those positions that the previous administration was advancing. Um, so with that, I will stop uh, and turn it over to my fellow panelists. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, we're gonna pat, go on now to, uh, to uh, Danny Sokol uh, from the University of Florida. Danny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm a professor at the University of Florida. One day a week, I'm also with White and Case. Uh, I'm speaking in my personal capacity because I have tenure and I can say what I'd like to. Um, so I wanna build off of what Maureen has started us to understand because she gave really a spectacular overview of so many of the moving pieces. I, I know for some of you, um, it might feel a little too soon, but the best way for me to describe some of the acrimony and animosity across agencies, not just in the US, but sometimes around the world, it's like David Lee Roth having to deal with uh, Van Halen or Sammy Hagar with Van Halen. Um, clearly the band was, you know, it was Eddie Van Halen. Um, but this kind of level of acrimony can really only, you know, compare um, to, to what we see around the world. And on the one hand, uh, Maureen suggests that there's a, we, we've moved away from some of that acrimony. I will actually suggest things are gonna get worse. And for my, what I had prepared, in the sense I have to revise based on what's happened in the last 24 hours, seemingly a massive report about big tech also fundamentally um, is going to maybe make us have to revisit uh, some, some of these kinds of issues in 5G uh, because all of a sudden um, the House uh, report suggests, wait a second, let's rethink essential facilities and let's expand it out to um, what we haven't seen at the Supreme Court ever with single firm conduct, but certainly with lower level courts, not since really the 70s, um, which again goes to when Van Halen started. I know it's, it's tough for all of us, um, but I wanna focus on something else that Maureen said. So not only is US law potentially changing depending on a number of factors that we still can't predict short term, a lot of what we have to be concerned about is simply even if we had very clear case law and, and even frankly, no regime change in November, everything both in the United States and around the world is still at risk. And it's at risk because 5G is a very different ball game and you have different players involved. And if we take, and, and you can see, I have both types of phone, either a Samsung phone or an Apple iPhone. Um, and we say, wow, we've got big issues when the, when, when the product at question is $800. Imagine instead it's a car 
at $80,000. So every time you thought you had some amount of legal certainty, um, if your position is small assailable unit, I guess it's the same. But if you think that the patent should be based on the entire value of a product, funny thing happens when you add an extra set of zeros, um, you're going to fight for your life again. And the reason why this matters is because up until now, um, some of the largest, most politically connected companies around the world in the auto industry, whether in the United States, Korea, China, um, or Germany, really haven't played a huge role um, in this debate. All of their resources, I think, going forward are fundamentally going to be about trying uh, to position themselves in ways that make sense for, for them. Uh, whether or not that's what the law should be, that's a separate question. I'm simply saying um, nothing is set in stone anymore. Um, so it's not just with cars. We can also think about all kinds of other IoT products. It's If we think of 5G as essentially the future of IoT, um, we can think across so many different parts of the supply chain where this is happening, both from our, you know, uh, talking refrigerators all the way up to very uh, complex um, heavy industry. Different set of players, lots of people who want to shape case law one way or the other. And to add on to what Marina said, uh, so there's been clarity increasingly in US courts with the exception of Qualcomm. And I know John is going to talk a little bit more about that. I'll just say, if you like the decision in the Ninth Circuit, if you even if, you, even if you love the decision, there's some problems beyond outcome in how the case was written up. Um, and that creates uncertainty. And um, so, so I, I note that, but I also note the rest of the world is watching. And Maureen is absolutely right to focus on rest of the world. Um, so partly it may be uh, institutional design features of the systems in Asia, um, that, you know, that look more towards a European approach that tends to be different than the US approach, but, or it could be a little more overt, um, shall, shall we say, uh, industrial policy at play. Uh, the cases come out differently. And um, we're still waiting on the Korean Supreme Court decision also involving Qualcomm. I'll take anyone at 98 to 1 odds that I know exactly how this case is coming out. 98 to 1 odds because, um, you know, I want to have some margin of error. And it's not going to come out in favor of Qualcomm. Um, and so in this world, the big takeaway that I would suggest is antitrust remains within the field of antitrust, remains in flux. The combination of antitrust IP and contract law and their complex intersection that Maureen gave us a bit of a sense of also, I think, remains in flux. It's going to get harder, I think, not easier. Um, and what that means is for investment uh, decision making on the part of firms, a lot of uncertainty. And that, you know, is going to, in certain ways, uh, impact our ability to innovate. And I'll end there and uh, yield the rest of the time to the other panelists. Thank you, Danny. Our next speaker is Ers Erska Petrov Petrovich. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And good, and good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. It's an honor to be part of this panel. And what I'm planning to do is to talk a little bit about the developments that we have seen across the Atlantic in Europe. This summer, there have been several decisions related to standard essential patents. The two most important one being the UK Supreme Court decision in Unwire Planet v. Huawei, and the second, the decision of the German Court of Justice in System v. Higher. In all these cases, of course, the courts address different issues, but we are definitely seeing some convergence in the approaches that courts in Europe are adopting towards some very important issues in relation to standard essential patents. We are seeing a convergence in particular towards three issues. First, injunctions, 
The second, the interpretation of the friend commitment, and in particular, the non-discrimination requirement of the friend commitment. And third, antitrust law or competition law, as it's typically referred to in Europe. When it comes to injunctions, both the UK Supreme Court and the German Federal Court of Justice recognize that injunctions remain available remedies against infringers of standard essential patents. The UK Supreme Court explicitly rejected the argument that the friend commitment uh, um, eliminates the SCP holder's right to request an injunction and limits the available remedies to monetary compensation. The court acknowledged that the friend commitment might limit the circumstances in which an SCP holder might be able to obtain an injunction, but said that there is no categorical rule against uh, an injunction. Uh, rather, the court emphasized that injunctions should be remain on the table to ensure that an implementer has the incentive to negotiate and eventually accept friend license terms. In that very specific case, the court found uh, that an injunction was appropriate because the um, implementer was found to infringe a valid, uh, valid standard essential patent and was not willing to enter into a license agreement on terms that the court found to be friend. In Germany, uh, the Federal Court of Justice adopted a very similar approach. The court recognized that even an SCP holder has the right to request and sometimes obtain an injunction. And in that case, the court focused the analysis on the negotiating behavior of the two parties and found that the defendant was engaging in delaying practices and wasn't really interested in entering into a license agreement on front terms. And the court found that the uh, it was appropriate to issue an injunction in that case. So like the Supreme Court in the UK, the German Federal Court of Justice also recognized that there is no categorical rule against injunction and that the facts of the case might support the issuance of such a remedy. Now, the second topic in which we are seeing the convergence is the interpretation of the non-discrimination requirement of the threat commitment. Uh, both the UK Supreme Court and the court in Germany agree that uh, the non-discrimination requirement does not impose on an SCP holder a duty to offer the same royalty to all licensees. The court seem to agree that there is a range of royalties that might be considered friend, and the fact that an SCP holder has offered to one of its licensees a, a royalty that is closer to the lower bound of that range does not create the duty for the SCP holder to offer that exact royalty to all its licensees. Um, in the UK, the, all court found that there might be various justifications for the, sub hold, for the SCP holder to offer a lower royalty to some licensees. In the UK, the Supreme Court found that the SCP holder was in financial distress at the time when it offered a lower royalty to one of its licensees. Um, in Germany, the court found that the SCP holder was forced by a um, foreign authority to offer a lower royalty to one of its licensees. And court said that found not really found that there was no issue in the fact that there were differential royalties among licenses. So also in this case, courts refused to adopt a categorical rule and and really focused on examining the specific facts of the case. The third topic in which we are seeing a convergence is competition law and whether an SCP holder violates through its licensing practices or behavior in general competition law. And uh, both the UK Supreme Court and the German Federal Court examined whether an SCP holder has violated competition law by requesting the court to issue an injunction. And they found that it did not. Um, the courts acknowledge that SCP holders are not immune from antitrust and that in some exceptional cases, a request to an injunction might violate EU competition law. But they were really quite skeptical um, about this argument, and they have really analyzed the specific facts of, of the case in determining whether the challenge practice was uh, anti-competitive. So in short, we are seeing that courts uh, in Europe are reaching similar conclusions about topics related to standard essential patents. 
uh, all courts are recognizing the need to um, protect both the interest of implementers and the interest of SCP holders. We also see that courts are less willing to adopt their conclusions based on categorical rules or based on abstract theories and are instead really focusing more on an evidence-based analysis. Well, thank you very much. Uh, John Yoon is our next speaker. John is an associate professor at Antonin Scalia Law School and also the director of uh, education programs for the Global Antitrust Institute, which is also at Antonin Scalia Law School. Thank you, Henry. And thank you for the organizers of the conference for having me. Um, so this is just to build on the already excellent comments already made by the fellow panelists here. Um, so just one thing, you know, since we're talking about 5G, where did 5G come from? And, uh, you know, it's a long process. If you look, I recently looked at the roadmap to get us to 5G and we can go as far back, I think at least to 20, uh, 2010. And so these standards take a long time to evolve. And if we look at the mobile phone industry from 2000, when very few people had it to 2007 and nine, when I think smartphones really sort of exploded to now with, the, uh, with 5G and really smartphones dominating a lot of commerce and a lot of certainly antitrust and IP issues. But at the center of these are the S SSOs, the standard uh, setting organizations or standard development organizations and the, and the SEPs in which they designate. And so these FRAN commitments clearly are at this intersection as Danny mentioned between IP and antitrust. So uh, I wanna talk very briefly about these SSOs. And I think maybe one approach that is useful to think about is that in terms of a multi-sided platforms, we can fit these uh, SSOs within that framework in the sense that they are balancing the interests of two distinct groups have, that have competing incentives. You have the innovators and the implementers and uh, Orska mentioned the implementers and, and both sides are, are coming aboard. And so the SSO needs to attract both groups. And so it is uh, purposely balancing them. And so their incentives are governed by that. Consequently, when you see things such as Fran, and I think there's frustration that it's sort of vaguely defined and, and why aren't these SSOs really kind of cracking down and would hold up or hold out. Um, and I think it's by design. And the reason why it's by design is because they're competing with other organizations and competing to attract uh, both groups. And so if they make it, tip it to one side or another, I think that's gonna create imbalance and you're gonna see the thing unravel. And that would actually, I think, lead to harm because standardization is certainly, I think, welfare maximizing on net. So with that, um, I, I'm gonna switch over to, to Qualcomm. And uh, I did spend some time at the FTC when it was there. So I'm not actually sure how much I can say or not say. So I'll just keep it at a very broad level, uh, generally speaking. Um, and as Danny mentioned that the Ninth Circuit uh, had its decision. And when I look at the case, uh, I see it as really just a couple of things that uh, the court actually really felt were important. The first is this antitrust duty to deal. So one of the big issues in this case is Qualcomm owns both the chipsets as well as the licensing, the IPs, the SEPs that they're obligated to uh, license on FRAN terms. So then the question becomes, uh, where do they license it to, right? Do they license it to their rival chipset manufacturers or do they license it at the device level? And so Qualcomm, as well as Nokia and Ericsson all uh, license it at the device level and they have efficiency justifications for that but obviously it creates some, some degree of, of discomfort from the perspective of their rivals. And so the Ninth Circuit really did focus in on that aspect of the case. And I think that to me, just in initial reading is their strongest arguments and the cleanest arguments. Uh, some of the, the more confusion or, or, or less clear uh, explanations come with um, the, 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 what the, what I call the tax theory, which I don't think it helps a lot of people, but this is the, no, no license, no chips policy. Um, that's a little more involved and perhaps that's what we'll get into. So I'll, I'll leave that for, for later remarks. But uh, with that, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll close out my remarks. Well, thank you, John. Uh, folks in the, uh, in the audience, we're gonna run through uh, the panelists to give them a chance to respond to each other and ask questions to each other. Uh, and then we'll be looking for questions from the audience that you can use the chat function for that. And, 
and I will try to, uh, uh, what would be multitasking for me to listen and read at the same time. Um, but we'll start off with Maureen and just go through in the order, but Maureen, feel free to ask clarification questions uh, for the, from the other um, panelists or to just raise some questions that you think should be overall discussed on the panel. Thank you. Sure, no, th thanks, Henry. And I really appreciated hearing everyone's views and particularly from Erska hearing kind of what's happening uh, in, in Europe. It was very, very uh, interesting to me. I guess, uh, you know, Danny mentioned um, Korea, uh, right, decisions there. So I guess for the panel, I would say, where do we see things going globally, particularly on, on 5G? Because we've got Europe, we've got China, we've got India really emerging uh, on the scene here too, very, very much uh, in these fields. So I don't, don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but I'd be interested in, in hearing any views about <laughs> gl globally where things might be heading or where some new problem spots may arise. Jamie, what do you think? So, um... Maureen's right to focus on India. Uh, so there were three cases there involving standard essential patents uh, and some bizarre theories. They seem to have more or less disappeared. The big question is, again, as the world shifts, uh, what's happening? And, and I'd say that um, Unlike the other jurisdictions that we've talked about, they haven't gone after the large uh, companies uh, with the exception of Ericsson, I think, um, uh, in, in those early cases. But so I, I'd say what we're seeing, whether it's India or the European Commission or potentially the United States, so much of what's gonna happen around the world, we're again, if we're assuming an antitrust world, do we still think it's going to be an economically based antitrust world? Some of you would say, hey, I've been doing work in some of those jurisdictions for quite some time. Um, it's not really as uh, economics based as you'd like to think it is. Um, and maybe there's some truth to that too. Um, and so I, the world is just really in flux as much as I'd like to say, I know where things are going. I, I'm not sure what that means, except there will be more aggressive enforcement. What exactly, where that's going to come up is unclear. And in part, it's unclear because you need to have companies that are highly mobilized that want to change the law and who understand that there's a roadmap of how to do this in many jurisdictions, which is you basically play off the agencies and then each and every time one agency starts an investigation, another agency also wants to start an investigation. Kind of like trying to feel like you, you two are doing something. Um, so not sure where it's going to begin, but it will begin soon or um, to mix metaphors since earlier I talked about Van Halen, I think this one would be winter is coming. I don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. <laughs> John, any reaction? Um, I did actually have a, a, um, a question. So Dan, you mentioned that Korea is close to making their decision and, and you certainly have a strong prediction of which way it's going. Um, I do have that question, like, what does that mean? I, I, you know, does that mean companies, if, to the extent that they can, they segment their their licensing and policies to a specific region, but given the global nature of a lot of these products, it just seems so difficult to me. And I just don't know, if to me, my mind, it's hard to harmonize two disparate decisions on the nature of FRAN and their obligations and its intersection with antitrust. So Danny, how do we navigate that? So I, I don't want to put Maureen on the spot, but she was really good about this. Um, she provided intellectual leadership uh, when she was at the commission. Uh, you have to articulate exactly what you just did, John, to explain that the stakes are really high and we need to have a certain amount of consistency. It has to be effects-based, um, based on the empirical evidence. Uh, Maureen also had a series of papers that really articulated that. Um, and... I think 
it requires leadership and someone has to lead um, more than anything else. Uh, and sometimes to lead when politically it's difficult to be a leader. Uh, and, and that really comes down to personalities. Maureen had it. Um, it's unclear if others do. Thank you, Danny, for <laughs> that <laughs> recognition of past efforts. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> we can't hear you, Henry. Sorry about that. Danny, I, I want to make sure we didn't skip over you in terms of asking questions to the to your fellow panelists. So the, the big question I have, I guess, probably then for Erska is, you know, are you, on the one hand, we have a series of cases in Europe and, and UK, you know, I put Europe asterisk, um, at least for now. So the, the question is, do you get a sense also that there is an undercurrent of people looking to uh, switch the deck around a little bit and, and that they're in the ascent or that have the recent decisions really um, pushed people back away from say the castle walls? Um, you know, how final is, you know, you, you made it seem like, oh, we're seeing good cases come out and things are, things are looking good. How temporary does that seem to you? Well, thank you for this question. Um, I think it's a very good question. Of course, I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a position to predict the developments, but I'm not sure um, things are settled in Europe. There are, of course, still many open questions. We've discussed a little bit the component level licensing, which is an ongoing discussion in the European Union. There are other issues that are still open. What I think we can see though, is really the emergence of some general principles. And these general principles are emerging across all European countries and the UK as well. And those general principles are really, are very broad is the need to adopt a balanced approach that takes the uh, interest of, that takes into account their interest of implementers and SAP holders, we are seeing that courts are increasingly looking at the existing industry practice to solve the various questions that they face. So I'm not sure I would say that uh, these cases are set in stone. I, I know that some of them have actually opened new questions like the UK Supreme Court decision that stating that the court has the right to set a global front rate even without the consent of the parties. But we are seeing some very general principles that are emerging and I believe are there to stay. Any comments? Um, okay, well, we've got a number of questions that are popping up on the chat. Uh, Maureen, here's one for you. Uh, what kind of impact does the US IP jurisprudence have on the rest of the world? And then there's a similar uh, question for Erska. Uh, do you notice any similarities and differences between US and European judicial approach towards IP matters? So Maureen first. And sure, um, I, I think the US IP approach does have a big impact on, on, on the rest of the world. When I, um, you know, when I was commissioner, uh, I focused a lot on China. I went, you know, 13, 14 times there. And you know they were very versed and followed very very closely and were very quick to point to U.S. decisions about injunctions or about essential facilities or or things like that to say, well, look, you know, we are just doing what you do, right? So we we want to you know stop patent assertion entities or we want to you know injunctions are wrong or you shouldn't you know you you want competition and you need more competitors and the essential facilities doctrine is a way to do that. Um, so, so it definitely, so it not just gave the, um, you know, the guidance on IP rights, but what it did was the antitrust stuff really was sort of a 
to the extent that antitrust could be used to undermine IP rights, they look to the debates in the US as an example of that. And, and then conversely, I think in other, in other areas, they can look to things like, um, like you know, um, consistencies in the US antitrust law about protecting IP, where other countries may look to that and say, yeah, that's the way forward. That's the way to help de develop, you know, more of a, um, a dynamic economy. So it's got good and bad influences, I guess. <laughs> First quote. First quote. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the question is, are we seeing some similarities between the United States and in Europe when it comes to IP matters? And uh, of course, it's a very broad uh, question, and I, can, I could talk for hours about that, but maybe I could focus on two main topics. One is French-related issues and methodologies to um, determine what is a French royalty, and here we are definitely seeing a convergence. Of course, U.S. courts have way more practice than um, your courts in Europe, and European courts look a lot at what uh, their, uh, the courts in, in the US do. But we are seeing that on both sides of the Atlantic, the courts are starting to be reluctant in second guessing what is the value of a portfolio. And they are really turning to the market to see what the market has done in the past, how the market has evaluated the value of a specific portfolio. So I would say that this is something that is similar in both jurisdictions. It's really let's, both jurisdictions are saying, let's look at the market to find the, the answers. The second um, issue where we see a convergence between uh, the US and Europe is, I believe, antitrust. I don't think I would say anything controversial if I say that Europe has been more assertive in uh, enforcing antitrust, and we have doctrines that are recognized under EU competition law that are very that are not condemned under US antitrust law. But at least with respect to IP issues, I think that there is definitely a convergence between the two systems in the sense that both systems are kind of taking a step back and being very cautious in uh, applying antitrust law to disputes that are really about patent law and contract law. Any other, any reactions to uh, those comments? Okay, um, let me read another question here. This is uh, from Ben Bandana Singh. Um, it's uh, three hours back, India and Japan have finalized an ambitious agreement that provides for cooperation in 5G technology, artificial intelligence, and an array of other critical areas as the two strategic partners vowed to further broad base um, uh, their ties, including the in Indo-Pacific region. That's a, a, an observation uh, that I uh, wondered if anyone wanted to react to that or, or knew what, know what's going on there. So I, I'm not aware of that particular agreement, but, but what I would say is I think we are moving to what you might call a multipolar world, right? So you've got um, so when you have, you know, trade tensions, certainly between the US and China getting so intense, right? And um, I think that also creates, we had already mentioned India as an important point. Um, and um, I think we're, what we're creating maybe is a system where other countries can um, basically compete by saying, we're going to give more protection to IP rights, right? Than you know, you might be getting in a in China, and so I think I I don't know whether this is a, you know part of that. Obviously, uh, there's lots of Japanese companies that have lots of good good technology, but I you know we're seeing I think some movement towards saying it shouldn't just be U.S., China, and um, Europe and Japan a little bit too, but maybe more India, Vietnam, even Mexico. Uh, there's some movement towards moving some manufacturing to Mexico. So having a stronger protection of IP rights can be a way for countries to help develop, you know, investment and in industries in, the, in their countries. 
Any follow-ups on that? Okay, got another question here then. Um, this is a question for John. What is the likely strategy of Korean companies to handle IP disputes in the post-pandemic world? Wow, that's a big <laughs> one. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I don't know uh, is, the, is the bottom line. I think that's a, a tough one to predict um, with that. So I apologize. If others have, have commentary on that, uh, certainly uh, welcome to hear it. I, I did want to take a, a moment to mention something that uh, Orska mentioned, which uh, really triggered uh, something and I thought was very interesting. In terms of how the courts are dealing and maybe refraining from weighing in on these licensing disputes, um, I think that has a healthy impact on the SSOs themselves, because let's imagine the opposite where courts were very aggressive in setting terms and conditions and putting uh, flesh on the bones, if you will, of these FRAN commitments. And I think the role of the SSOs would be lessened and then in turn that would affect the incentive to join these organizations and set standards and SEPs. And so um, it seems like the courts are, are doing something that is really, to me, seems efficiency enhancing in that they're allowing the private parties themselves to determine the parameters of their agreement rather than court appointed. So that, that seems healthy. And I wasn't aware that Europe was largely it appears in harmony, at least currently with the US. So that's really interesting. Anyone else want to jump in on that? That's pretty good, Mr. Post pandemic. Let's try another one here. Um, why do you, I'm not sure who you mean, uh, think that SEP holders always ask or compel the implementate implementators to take a global patent license? Can that not be construed to be a form of abuse of dominant positions slash antitrust violation, uh, for example, section four of the Indian Competition Act? Who wants to jump on that one? I can take that one. <laughs> uh, well, I must say that I have, uh, I'm not familiar with the Indian Competition Act, so I won't be able to opine on that specifically. But if I can answer the um, question more generally. So I think that when we talk about global licensing in terms of um, standard essential patents, we need to distinguish two separate issue. The first issue is whether offering a license that is global rather than limited to a specific jurisdiction complies with the obligation under the FRAND commitment. And I think courts in Europe and the United States agree that this is a reasonable practice that's not, that does not violate the obligations under the FRAND commitment. And again, as we mentioned, courts look at what is the industry practice and they see that it's very common for parties to voluntarily enter in license agreements that are global rather than limited to a specific jurisdiction. So I think that's, that's fine and courts have largely acknowledged that. A second, issue, a second separate issue is whether a court can determine, um, oh, I forgot actually I should, in response to the question, I don't really see how an SAP holder could compel an implementer to enter into a global license because it doesn't really have a legal remedy to do that. If anything, the, the SAP holder will have to go to court and assert, assert the patents and then based on that get um, a compensation. Second issue is if the court decides to set front terms for a global license. And in that respect, I think that courts have adopted different approaches. In the US, I don't believe there has been any case in which a court has set the terms of a global license. They have always they have determined front rates, but they were always limited to the United States. In Germany, what courts do, they assess the offer that the SAP holder has made to a licensee and they compare to this offer to the terms included in other comparable license agreement. And based on that, they just determine whether the offer is friend or not. And in the UK, as we know, the Supreme Court has, has said that it's fine for the UK court to set global friend rates. And that might be more problematic. And it's not problematic per se necessarily, because I'm sure that many, uh, there have been many arbitration cases in which 
um, tribunal have said global front rate, the issue arises if the court that is going to set a front rate is in a jurisdiction where the rule of law is not up to the standard that uh, we see um, internationally recognized or that is, or the court is likely to make decisions based more on industrial policy justification than on the legal principles. I hope that answered the question. But yeah, I'm not sure about the Indian Competition Act. <laughs> Okay, I've got a, a, a note in my uh, my messages to announce that uh, the uh, CLE code, uh, apparently we have some people who are um, monitoring this via audio only. Uh, the CLE code is M-U-H-D-H-G-L-O-B-E. M-U-H-D-H-G-L-O-B-E. G L O B E. All right. Um, let me see. I've got a question here now um, uh, from. Uh, okay, we've had instances where SEP holders like Ericsson have made an Indian smartphone manufacturer to take a global license by threatening to disrupt the plan of the Indian company to launch an IPO. So there are not so legal but il not illegal ways to compel implementers to take a global license i guess that's a comment anyone want to react to that type of behavior or understand what it is anyone i guess that might have been in reaction to my answer and of course there are cases where you really need to do, look at the fact of the case to provide an answer. I'm not familiar with that specific case. I'm, I'm not sure I would be able to opine, but yeah, I think it's really, you really need to know the specific facts of, facts of the case to provide an answer. Okay. Well, great. We're getting near the end of our time. If we, anyone would like to make a, a kind of a final point that, uh, after the discussion, if there's something else they need to add into it, I'd appreciate it if you would do it right now. Maureen, do you have anything you think? Sure, I, I, I would say just uh, it continues to be an evolving space. Um, it's possible that the Supreme Court might actually, you know, eventually take the Qualcomm case. Uh, right now, there's not necessarily a circuit split, but should uh, non banc uh, reverse uh, the reversal of the district court, <laughs> come up with something, a different position uh, that, could, that could be very interesting. And as Danny mentioned, you know, antitrust law is undergoing some, you know, kind of uh, searching review. Um, so we have to watch uh, where the antitrust uh, boundaries may be moving as well. Uh, uh, John, do you have anything you would like to add? Uh, no, just the my my very brief final comment is that just emerging from this panel is just the need for harmonization across you know all the jurisdictions and and so uh, these technologies are so critical sort of to global innovation and so having disparate and uncertainty in terms of different legal regimes and and outcomes uh just seems like a very huge negative and i don't know the solution to that the solution can be worse than perhaps the problem but uh that being said there seems to be some need or space for for some harmonization okay erska last but not least well i agree that all these issues are going um to remain important and perhaps even again increasing importance in the future with the uh, coming internet of things and the expansion of the 5G standard. So I think that this will continue to be an important debate. Okay, well, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Danny, Danny had to drop off uh, a little bit early, uh, but uh, it's been a very informative panel. Very much appreciate it. Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dean Butler. Always great to have you on board, helping us with things. Fantastic panel. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, just really great session. That's going to conclude our programming for today. Tomorrow we'll come back at 1030 in the morning and we'll have a first session on looking at private ordering markets, following up quite a bit on what Director Iancu was talking about today, private ordering works, and we need to let markets do their thing. I think we heard a lot of that from today's, this afternoon's panel as well. And then our last panel tomorrow will be on technology leadership in 5G and IoT markets. 
And that will be run, as I said before, with our partner here at Scalia, the National Security Institute. So thanks, everyone, once again. And we will see everyone tomorrow morning, 1030. Bye.